my presentation to oh, yeah sorry so my presentation today is based on the results of a research that I've carried out over the last few years on the notion of mental symptom and the classical figure of the clinician. This work has provided the material for a book, L'Eclipse du Symptom, uh, published in uh, 2019 in French. Uh, most of the work in the field of philosophy of psychiatry has been focusing on questions of diagnosis, and on these particular kinds of things that are mental illnesses. Uh, the focus has been put on classification systems uh, like the GSM, the ICD, and so on, and rather little on the level of symptomatology or semiology. Uh, why such a neglect? At first sight, the notion of symptom does not pose a problem to the philosopher. A symptom in classical medical language designate the basic unit of clinical observation. It is the fact that the clinician observes at the patient's bed, the fact that he collects and he confronts with all the other data at his or her disposal to produce a diagnosis. It is the surface of the disease, its phenomenal appearance, that the clinician must, must correctly uh, uh, observe and interpret to know what the patient is suffering from and how to treat, to treat him. Symptoms and signs are classically opposed. As it is uh, commonly taught, symptoms are what the patient tells you and signs are what the clinician uh, observes or sees. In reality, this opposition is far too simplistic. And when we study both contemporary texts, but also old classical texts of medical literature, we can realize that this distinction between symptom and signs has never been perfectly uh, uh, clear. It's even less so in psychiatry, where most of the clinical material is obtained from the interrogation of the patient. So when you ask a psychiatrist what is a mental symptom, the, the answer uh, uh, can vary a lot, and especially uh, when you uh, uh, belong to the French culture. Uh, some say it's a fact, it's just a fact. Some other clinicians would say that it's a fact, but it has a meaning, which depends on the life history of the patient. Some will say that we just have to observe and correct the, uh, uh, the symptoms. Others will say that we have to know how to interpret them. Some will add that the symptoms are fixed or constant, or uh, that they depend specifically of the mental illness that produces them. And other will consider that they are very plastic in their nature, that they can shift, that they can move, and they can change according to people and context, and that they are not very specific. Some consider that by suppressing the symptom, like for instance, anxiety, you will suppress the essence of the illness. Others, on the contrary, consider that just suppressing the symptoms, like anxiety and not the cause of the anxiety, is only attacking the surface of the illness and not the illness or the mental disorder by itself. So my aim in my book was to make an broad historical investigation around the, model, the, the notion of psychiatric symptom back to the beginning of uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the psychiatry as an institution at the beginning of the 19th century. And by doing so, my research was also about clinical observation and clinical teaching in psychiatry. One of my goals was to finally characterize the traditional role of the psychiatrist as a clinician is specific skills and the cultural figures uh, uh, to which his observational skills are compared, like the figure of the painter, the figure of the botanist, the naturalist, and soon the detective. So I will not here focus on the specific uh, meaning of mental symptom, uh, and uh, no, uh, neither on the distinction between symptom and signs. Let's just say, uh, um, for the sake of the discussion, that first, 
the opposition, the distinction between symptom and signs has long posed many difficulties for clinicians during the history. It's, it has never be, been a clear distinction. Uh, but what appears progressively during the 19th century, uh, uh, 18th and 19th century, uh, and it, it is confirmed at the turn of the uh, anatomical clinical revolution, it's the idea of an epistemic superiority of science over the symptoms. Science are usually considered as more reliable and more stable than uh, symptoms. But their precise definitions continue to pose many difficulties and many authors deplore the fact that they are still regularly confused. Uh, a central claim of my book and I will go back, uh, I will then focus on a very specific section, but uh, the, the broad issue in my book was to demonstrate that we can find a very broad definition of the symptom in classical psychiatry, which is not specific of psychiatry, uh, a, a very general definition that you can find in, uh, uh, in all the medicine. So to put it in other words, in psychiatry for all the classical authors, and I, I went back to all the authors in French tradition, but also in German, English tradition, and American tradition. So let's say from Pinel to Esquirol to Kreplin to Charcot, de Clérambeau, to Henri A in the 20th century in France, but also to Kreplin, Bleuler, and or even Adolf Meyer in the US. So for all these authors, uh, uh, the symptom is just the effect of some underlying uh, disorder. It thus has uh, the nature of an index in the precise meaning that the philosopher uh, uh, Charles Peirce uh, 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 attributes to uh, this notion at the end of the 19th century. I quote Peirce, Indices are signs which stand for their objects in consequence of a real relationship to them. I put emphasis on real relationship to them. An index is a sign which stands for its object in consequence of having a real relation to it. A pointing finger is its type. Of this sort are all natural signs and physical symptoms. So Pierce himself, uh, uh, took as an example the physical symptoms in medicine, and we could say also mental symptoms in psychiatry. And he uh, took the classical example of the smoke that can be uh, an index of the cause that is the fire. So I claim that this very general uh, uh, conception of uh, symptom as an index uh, stand for all the uh, classical textbook in psychiatry. A second important claim of my book uh, was to, to demonstrate that this widely shared conception of the symptom tend to vanish in the middle of the 50s uh, for many different cultural and scientific reasons. Uh, so the idea was that this simple and intuitive uh, conception of the symptom uh, which is the same in psychiatry and in the rest of medicine, uh, start to be challenging, uh, challenged at this time. On the one hand, with the development of psychiatric epidemiology, psychometric measurements and so on, the symptoms tend to be reduced to the status of a raw fact that can be just collected, that can be measured and isolated uh, uh, with specific tools. And on the other hand, under the influence of psychoanalysis, uh, the symptom is enriched with the mysterious power of the signifier. So today, I will present a small part of my result. So while uh, a uh, very important part of my book uh, and my work was devoted at, on the beginning of uh, American psychiatry and especially the birth of psychiatric epidemiology uh, and its specific conception of symptom, I've chosen today to talk to you about something very French, so it will uh, work with my uh, very French accent. Uh, so maybe something that is maybe uh, uh, something weird for you or uh, very exotic, uh, but which I, I think is a very significant episode in French psychiatry uh, 
around the 50s. It's, um, it's rather well known in France, but not so well in the uh, uh, English spoken uh, literature. So let's start uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, the first part of my talk. So let's go back uh, to the 50s in France. And let's first examine very quickly uh, uh, the influence of the psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. So I know that just to say the name Lacan is enough for many psychiatrists and many colleagues in philosophy just to, to get them uh, nightmares. Uh, um, I, I'm not, I, I can tell you, I'm not a Lacanian at all. Uh, I, my work is just a work of a philosopher and a historian of medicine. Uh, and I, I want just to, to, to say something quickly about Lacan, just to say that after having been very uh, fashionable in the 50s and in the 50s, 70s, the Lacanian uh, uh, psychoanalysis has become marginal, uh, except in France and some uh, Latin American countries. But more generally, it is often accused of being very obscure and of lacking scientific foundations. So my aim here is not to criticize, uh, neither to rehabilitate uh, Lacanian uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, my uh, work here, just as a philosopher and historian of psychiatry, is to highlight the profound influence that is thought has had on a whole area of post-war French psychiatry. So, and I think that this is very important because in philosophy of psychiatry, uh, uh, the, the, now we tend to neglect the fact that uh, uh, for the good or for the bad, psychoanalysis has get a very long and uh, deep influence in the psychiatric thought. And even in the DSM, uh, there's a lot of concepts and methods that uh, are uh, um, uh, irritated from this long uh, um, uh, uh, tradition. So Jacques Lacan, so you know that he was a psychiatrist by training, uh, uh, carried out what he called a return to Freud in his famous research seminar that he organized from the 15s uh, onwards. And he was seeking to shed light on Freud's technical writings in the light of all the scientific progress made in various uh, domains like linguistic, like topology in mathematics, and even in the very beginning of the cognitive sciences. It's really difficult today to imagine the immense influence that Jacques Lacan had on the French intellectual landscape in the 50s and in the 60s. Everyone, the intellectuals, the movie stars, so on, everyone was rushing to attend his seminar in Paris uh, at Saint Anne. He was a kind of master for a world generation of young psychoanalysts and also young philosophers, both a figure very enigmatic and very brilliant. When he published his writings in 1966, Les Écrits, this is the only authorized book he ever published, most of his teaching being oral, just oral, uh, this only book was a huge success. You can find, well, if next time you come to France, just have a look. You can find in any attic, in any house in France. You can find, you can find it in any small bookstore. You can find an old copy uh, of the écrit. This book, in spite, uh, despite its great complexity, was a bestseller. It, there was more than one hundred thousand copies sold just in the early. 70s. So every philosopher in France would uh, uh, dream to, uh, to, to, to sell uh, uh, as many uh, books. In English, uh, a translation has been scattered from the late 70s until today, uh, depending on many, many cultural factors uh, about uh, uh, readers, psychoanalysis, and so on. So I won't uh, go into in this 
uh, details, but there's, of course, a very different tradition, the Spanish tradition of Lacanian translation, English tradition, and, uh, uh, but it was very influent in France. In the Écrit of Jacques Lacan, the first text that appears in the order of the text, so the Écrit has a chronological order of composition, except for the first one, which is therefore considered as one of the most important texts written by Lacan. And it has become uh, uh, one of the most famous texts uh, of Jacques Lacan. It is called the Seminar of the Purloined Letter. So I do not have time here to dwell on this rich and audacious text. I will simply recall you that uh, it is based on the reading of a short story by Edgar Poe, The Purloined Letter. And Jacques Lacan read it very carefully and he develops the comparison between the figure of the psychoanalyst and the figure of the detective. And he compares the symptom presented by the patient to the symbolic character of the purloined letter. So a stolen letter, uh, uh, a letter that has been stolen from the queen and a, a letter that circulates from hand to hand between many characters uh, but whose content is never known. We know just that the content is very precious, but at any time in the story, we don't know exactly what this letter uh, contains. Is it uh, a, 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 a love letter? Is it a denunciation letter? We will never know, okay? So from this short Edgar Poe uh, story, Laca, Lacan draws many important conclusions for his psychoanalytical practice. He compares the symptom to a signifier, uh, so drawing the notion from linguistic, from socio, okay? Uh, and he says that a set of symptoms appears like a signifying chain. And in many texts uh, later from the instance of the letter in the unconscious of reason since Freud published in 1957, uh, 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 sorry, and that you can find in the écrit to the late Lacanian, so very uh, hard to follow, uh, very obscure, uh, Joyce, the symptom in uh, 1950, uh, 1975, sorry, 1975. So for almost 20 years, Lacan will, will try to refine this original theory of the psychoanalytic symptom. And this theory can be summarized in the famous algorithm S over S, so the signifier over the signified, separated by a bar. So there's many, many commentaries about what exactly it means for psychoanalysis, this algorithm S over S. Uh, S. Uh, I, I will just uh, uh, um, uh, uh, skip on that. We, I, I don't have time to, to specifically uh, uh, analyze this uh, uh, situation. Uh, there has been a lot of very interesting scholarly commentaries on Lacan's, uh, Lacan's proposal. I provide, provide here just two of the most significant. First one uh, by Nancy and Lacoulabart. Le titre de la lettre, it has been uh, uh, translated in uh, English in 1992, if I remember well. Very great book, philosophical book, which is a philosophical commentary of the Lacanian uh, proposal, which show, uh, which put in, uh, uh, into evidence all the, bor the borrowings from linguistic, from Heidegger, from levi strauss anthropology, structuralism, and so on, and also the fragilities of Lacan's uh, uh, reading of Freud. And another very great book by Jacques Derrida, very harsh. Uh, uh, when Derrida will publish his text, uh, he, uh, Lacan will be very, very angry, uh, and it, which is called La Carte Postale, the postcard, uh, also uh, uh, translated into uh, um, uh, English. So, anyway, what is very important for me here to highlight is just two ideas. First, the idea that, uh, uh, for according to Lacan, a mental illness is structural like a language. 
okay? Just as the unconscious, as you know, is structured like a language. I quote him, so in French, uh, I put, I, I found the uh, uh, official translation on my slides uh, of Jacques Lacan. So if you're okay, I, I, I read it in French and you can follow it in English. So Lacan says, il est déjà tout à fait clair que le symptôme se résout tout entier dans une analyse du langage parce qu'il est lui-même structuré comme un langage, qu'il est langage dont la parole doit être délivrée. So first idea, uh, 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 so the symptom revolves uh, in an analysis of language. Second idea, and this is very important for my uh, uh, demonstration, I just want you to, uh, to, um, to, um, to observe that Lacan never confuse his uh, uh, specific uh, uh, conception of the psychoanalytical symptom with the general uh, meaning of the general definition of the medical uh, symptom, which according to him has, and I agree with him, the nature of an edex. So he clearly distinguishes between the two, the psychoanalysis and the general medical meaning. So he, 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 he writes, à la différence du signe, de la fumée qui n'est pas sans feu, feu qu'elle indique avec appel éventuellement à l'éteindre, le symptôme ne s'interprète que dans l'ordre du signifiant. Le signifiant n'a de sens que de sa relation à un autre signifiant. C'est dans cette articulation que réside la vérité du symptôme. Another quote, very important. Ce que la conception linguistique qui doit former le travailleur dans son initiation de base lui apprendra, c'est à attendre du symptôme qu'il fasse la preuve de sa fonction de signifiant. OK to expect the symptom to prove its function as a signifier, c'est-à-dire de ce par quoi il se distingue de l'indice naturel que le même terme désigne couramment en médecine. Uh, uh, so it, uh, it is to be distinguished from the natural index that the same term currently designates in medicine. So Lacan was very clear that what he was making, what he was doing for psychoanalysis had merely nothing to do with the general Uh, traditional conception of a symptom. And this is very important because uh, uh, Lacan comes from traditional uh, uh, psychiatry. Uh, in his first writings in the uh, 30s, uh, when he write his medical dissertation, he still has a very classical conception of the symptom as causal relationship between a disease and uh, uh, an effect. So th this new conception, it's really specific of the 19, uh, the, in the middle of the 1950s. So in conclusion of this part, Lacan introduces into psychoanalysis the concept of signifier that he borrows from linguistic in order to give, to provide an original and a fresh interpretation of the work by the uh, psychoanalyst. So now I'm going to show that this, this conception uh, has insidiously contaminated the whole psychiatric discourse, and especially in the French uh, medical uh, uh, psychological culture, creating what I call a myth of Vilnes as a, 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 a language. So, Let's get now to another important figure of the French, sorry. Sorry, the French uh, 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 touch of the 60s, the philosopher Michel Foucault. Uh, uh, I, I told you that I, I, I'm not a Lacanian, but I, I could say I, I'm a Foucauldian. I have a deep respect and admiration for uh, Foucault's work. Uh, I think Foucault's work is overrated in France but it is certainly under-evaluated in the philosophy, in the English philosophy of psychiatry. I think he's really a great figure. And I consider one of his first book, uh, Birth of a Clinic, to be an extraordinary book, very powerful, subtle, and very still useful uh, today. I often study this book with my students, and I gladly recommend it to anyone interested in the history of medicine in general. But Foucault, like many philosophers and like any human, make mistakes. And in this particular book, he made a huge mistake, according to me, uh, a mistake that I consider unfortunate uh, 
uh, and I will try to, uh, to uh, show what was this mistake. So I will make a very quick commentary of the, uh, this uh, important book. So the, the, the mistake of, made by uh, Michel Foucault can be found in the birth of the clinic, as I told you, a very great book. And precisely in the chapter six of this book entitled Sign on Cases. So Foucault focuses on the story of clinics back to the 18th and 19th century, especially in France. And he focuses on the distinction between the symptom and the sign uh, uh, in 18th century clinical thought. He perceives clearly, as I told you, that the distinction is not clear at all at this time. And he, uh, 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 there's not, it's not a distinction uh, that you can find in the things themselves. It's a distinction uh, that uh, uh, appears in the consciousness of the clinician. So it is the uh, physician's knowledge that transforms a symptom into a sign. But uh, uh, this distinction, many people try to, uh, uh, to clarify it at the time. And Foucault uh, say, says many, many interesting things to try to understand how uh, traditional clinicians are making this uh, uh, conceptual uh, distinction. Uh, and Foucault says, okay, for, for many, many authors at this, many authors at this time, uh, the place of the symptom is quite ambiguous. Why uh, is the reason for this ambiguity of the symptom in general medicine? And Foucault continues, he says, it is due precisely to the fact that the symptom is never as immediate as it is appear. The symptoms clear claim to be on the level of the nature as a mere phenomenon, and yet it always presupposes the existence of the total structure of the disease. To demonstrate this point, Foucault relies on a passage from Pierre-Marie-Auguste Proussonnet. I put his picture on the, uh, uh, on, on the right corner of the slide. So Broussonnet, uh, the book, uh, the, the Tableau élémentaire de la sémiotique de Broussonnet, one of the first clinical textbooks in uh, French uh, uh, classical li uh, medical literature, when the author is not very clear in his attempt to uh, uh, distinguish symptom and the sign. And by characterizing the symptom as a phenomenon that designates illness, Broussonnet seems to want to reconcile two incompatible properties, the raw passivity of the phenomenon and the active indication of illness. And Foucault comments this uh, uh, specific uh, um, uh, quote of Broussonnet with this quote. So it is a quote by Foucault. He writes, I, I put also uh, the French and the uh, uh, English translation uh, of Foucault. So Foucault comments, par cette simple opposition aux formes de la santé, le symptôme quitte sa passivité de phénomène naturel et devient signifiant de la maladie, becomes a signifier of the disease. The concept of signifiers, which Foucault introduces here and which is not in Broussonnet text anywhere, uh, aims at underlying this paradoxical character of the symptom in Broussonnet's work, in its modality to be both passive and active with respect to the illness. So this reference to the Saussurean sign in Foucault's writing is not at all accidental, and it is merely metaphorical. It is explicitly uh, uh, made by Foucault, and it con constitutes explicitly the art of the argument of the birth of a clinic. What is the central thesis of uh, uh, Foucault's book? It is that the clinical experience in the modern uh, uh, medicine was made possible by a complete reorganization, a profound reorganization of what he called the medical gaze. Far from being summarized just by a new scientific method put forward by some uh, 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 clinician with uh, the anatomical clinical revolution, Foucault tried to show that there was a profound reorganization, not only epistemological, but also political and also ethical mutation of all medical gaze 
a way of for, for the uh, uh, traditional clinician to understand the nature of the disease and the disposition of the medical knowledge uh, uh, in general. So he, he, he concentrate of the he, he, he focus on the practices of occultation, dissection, and so on, but also on all the clinical observation skills that are involved in uh, uh, the work of a clinician during the 18th and 19th century. So this profound and this systematic reorganization of the medical gaze that gave birth for, according to Foucault, to the modern clinic, uh, uh, this uh, uh, reorganization breaks down into three main theoretical moments, three main theoretical uh, um, uh, periods that are conceptually gathered in the very first sentence of the book, so the first sentence of the book, book uh, Foucault writes, this book is about space, it is about language and about death, it is about the act of seeing the gaze. So space, language, death, uh, three epistemological modalities of the modern constitution of the medical gaze, like three contractions of the medical gaze that Foucault will analyze uh, at, at attentively. So first moment, the idea, so it's the first chapters of the book, it is called Spaces and Classes, the gaze as a space from Sidenham, English Sidenham to Boissier de Sauvage or to Cullen, uh, and even to Pinel. Uh, the idea is that the classifying thought of the physician is to organize the clinical perception according to a space of projection without any death. Okay, diseases are, per are, are perceived as species that are both natural and ideal, assembled in the form of tables that the, uh, by the exercise of a qualitative gaze. This was already the theme of the madman in the Garden of Species that Foucault will uh, elaborate in his History of Madness. So first, the gaze as a space, it's Cullen, it's Sidenham, uh, uh, and so on. Second moment, chapter six to seven, uh, second uh, uh, very important uh, episode, the gaze as a language. So uh, uh, the idea is, uh, according to Foucault, is that we uh, uh, go from a botany of symptoms to what he calls a grammar of science. And it's obviously this moment that will interest me here, since it is here that Foucault will explicitly defend the idea that the clinician of the early 19th century uh, defend the idea that the composition of the being of the disease is of a linguistic type. And third moment, just to have an idea, it's the late chapter, chapter eight, nine, and 10, the gaze on death. So how the pathological anatomy is going to reintroduce with Bichat and Brousset the thought of a classification uh, and uh, will uh, consecrate the primacy of science over symptoms uh, through the setting up of a fine uh, dialectic uh, between the surface and the death, the, 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 the profound and the death of the body. So now it's the lesion, the localization that takes the importance over the visibility and show uh, how uh, the, the disease is conceived of. So here the, is the general movement of uh, uh, Foucault's book. So of course, I will focus just here very uh, briefly of the second moment, the gaze as a language. So the originality of Foucault's point of view is to show that the all uh, uh, new uh, clinical revolution is prepared uh, with a very uh, uh, fine grain uh, articulation between uh, precisely uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the end of the uh, uh, 18th century and the very beginning of the 19th century. So what happened at that time? According to Foucault, for a moment, clinicians stopped just to herborizing to try to reorganize their clinical vision in a very new way. Foucault identifies two major tendencies uh, in the big epistemological reflection that physicians were deploying at that time. Uh, there were some people who uh, wanted to, uh, uh, to thought in the probabilities 
and in the birth of statistics to uh, uh, consolidate the conjectural science that was medicine. This is what Foucault calls the arithmetic model, uh, who early promise on, po on power of seduction uh, 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 was very uh, uh, intense in French uh, uh, medicine. For instance, Esquirol was very fond with uh, statistics. But according to Foucault, this model will never quite succeed uh, 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 and it, we, it will remain, remain just in the state of a premise. Uh, uh, um, to this arithmetical, uh, arithmetic model of disease, Foucault opposes the grammatical model of disease, uh, which, according to the author, became very operative and very influent during all the 18th century. The philosophical conception of Foucault is based on many quotations, so I, I, I will not go into detail, but he, he, he used many times the concept of the sin, signifier, and he says many times that according to the traditional clinician, any cl clinician, okay, so uh, uh, like Brousset, but also like Pinel, like Esquirol, according to Foucault, the form of composition of the being of a disease is of a linguistic type. And he says also that the armature of the real is design of the model of a language. So to demonstrate his point, he used different uh, 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 textual elements. First, a quotation by Double. So he's an old French uh, uh, physician. Uh, and uh, it's clear that Double in this quote uh, there's no English quotation, says he make a comparison between uh, uh, the, the set of a symptom and the letters of an alphabet, uh, like in the Scrabble, in the, 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 the play uh, Scrabble, that a clinician must uh, decipher to understand what is uh, uh, the, the diagnosis. But Foucault here neglects the fact that Double takes another example and he, he makes a comparison between a diagnosis and not the letters of the alphabet, but the uh, numbers in an equation, in a mathematical equation. Second element, uh, Landre Beauvais uh, distinguishes between the sig symptom signifying and the phenomenon signified. And it is the only, the only uh, uh, occurrence, the only quote. Uh, OK, it's. Uh, uh, very disturbing quotation, but it is the only quotation in the whole uh, traditional uh, 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 medical textbook that you can find the notion of signified, signified uh, uh, in links with uh, the notion of symptom. And more interesting, uh, uh, Foucault relies on Condillac, the philosopher Condillac uh, theory of language. Uh, as you know, Condillac was very influent uh, in the, uh, uh, on the, the French psychiatrist at the beginning of the 19th century, like uh, Esquirol and Pinel. And he, 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 he draws on Condillac theory of language to show that uh, 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 many people at this time uh, uh, consider that uh, uh, the world by itself has some kind of alphabetical structure. So, uh, is it sufficient, these three elements, to establish the idea that there was, there would be a precise idea uh, for the clinician of the 18th century that the disease would follow an alphabetical structure? I think it doesn't. You can find in any classical textbook, like in Pinel, like in Cabanis, in many, many authors, Kreplin, Bleuler, any, any authors, the idea that the symptom should be considered as a signifier, okay? So we must accept the following conclusion. There's, there was not at this time some broad conception that the disease would be organized like a disease, like a text, oh, sorry. So there's no epistemological myth uh, from this time. The only place we can put this epistemological myth is in Foucault's head, okay? The language of illness is a myth, but it's not an old myth, it's a contemporary myth invented by Foucault. What, uh, what was the reason of Foucault's mis misinterpret misinterpretation? Of course, uh, it was the influence of Lacan. Uh, we know that the young Foucault was a, 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 a close reader of uh, Jacques Lacan, uh, 
you can find many uh, 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 quotation in D.A. Cree very early in the 60s where Foucault realized on Lacan when he speaks about Rousseau, when he speaks about Freud and many authors, and he takes the notion of signifier clearly from Lacan. And it is also interesting to, to, to say that uh, uh, the, the later Foucault, late in the 50s, in the 70s, will come back and says, okay, I, I made some mistake and it was very fashion in the 50s to, and 60s to talk about signifier any times with the greatest respect. And now I take uh, some distance with this notion was very uh, fashioned uh, at the beginning of the 60s. But still, uh, 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 there was a very uh, broad influence and Foucault was uh, uh, can, can be uh, was uh, the main uh, 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 philosopher uh, who is responsible of the propagation of the myth. So why it, it is important to debunk it? And I have almost finished. Uh, so Foucault committed an error of interpretation by seeing signifiers in classical texts where there's no signifiers at all. And Roland Barthes, uh, uh, in a very important text, Semiology and Medicine, uh, take this uh, example and say, okay, the diagnosis in medicine has something to do like an act of reading, which implies a composition of linguistic science. And for him, the medical semiology and the medical uh, linguistics uh, share the same roots. And I think he's wrong. And Roland Barthes says, okay, my, my, uh, uh, my, my claim and uh, my sources to say that is specifically uh, Foucault birth of the clinic. Uh, but many uh, French uh, philosophers and historians will propagate this myth, like for instance, uh, 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 Jean Garabet, the French historian Jean Garabet, who says that, uh, so it's funny, he says, Landré Beauvais, introduces the notion of signifier much before Ferdinand de uh, Saussure. It's completely anachronical. Uh, it's not true. Ferdinand de uh, 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 Landré Beauvais uh, did not invent very, uh, uh, a couple of decades before uh, uh, Ferdinand de Saussure the, the notion of signifier. He just said something signifier at the moment in a specific text, but in a very classical way. Uh, this uh, myth, you can find it also in many English uh, spoken texts, like for instance in Berrios, when uh, Berrios and Markova uh, uh, write, I, I quote, the epistemological distinction between disease and symptom, the later conceived as a linguistic signifier representing a signified a disease, was completed only by the turn of the 19th century. That's wrong. Uh, it has never been conceived as something like a signifier. We can find the same in the great uh, uh, Alan Young, uh, 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 in the great text uh, of by Alan Young, when he, he writes in crippling systems, sig symptoms are, are signifiers which get their meanings through being just opposed and so on. It's not true. If you go back to Kreplin, you can't find the notion of signifier anywhere, and you can find uh, uh, also the notion that it will be something like uh, a, a composition of uh, uh, signifiers. So, uh, uh, as I told you, this is very important, and it, it is a mistake that is, uh, uh, is commonly taught in medical faculties here in France to say that, that the symptom is something like a symptom. Why, in conclusion, it is very important to debunk this myth. Uh, the, 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 the big uh, issue about this myth is that it, uh, 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 it neglects the fact that uh, uh, disease is uh, uh, the relation between the symptom and the disease is not a conventional or an arbitrary relationship. It is a causal relationship. Disease is not a text to be deciphered. It is a causal story to be uh, unraveled. And there's a causal structure attached to the notion of symptom. And this causal structure has been completely constant in all uh, 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 the traditional uh, uh, medicines. So it is very uh, simple idea that I wanted to, um, to, to bring into conclusion. But as you, you can see, it 
took me a lot of work and to, 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 to just verify in many uh, classical textbooks if really there was something like uh, the idea that the disease is conceived of as a text or not. So to, to, uh, I was too long, sorry. So uh, uh, just to say, if we jump to the contemporary era that this uh, uh, question about symptom is still not clear even today. Uh, according to the DSM, it's not clear to, to, to understand what uh, is the profound conception of uh, a, a symptom according to the DSM. Uh, uh, is there any causal relation between like a major depression and the, uh, uh, the symptom of a depression? Uh, and in, in the DSM, uh, um, there's kind of a mix of a traditional conception of a symptom and a psychometric conception as an outcome. Uh, 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 the symptom uh, in the DSM is merely conceived as a, a criteria and it brings many, as you know, uh, theoretical difficulties like do the symptoms interact which is each other. Uh, the DSM remained very evasive about this important issue because it wants to be, uh, as you know, uh, half theoretical. This difficulty, you can find it also in the uh, RDOC project because there's no theory at all about the symptom in the RDOC project. And it's not clear at all what they want to do with this classical conception of the symptom. Uh, two very uh, uh, interesting model, I quote uh, Berrios. Berrios uh, developed what he calls a Cambridge model of uh, 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 the, the symptom. It's very rich and interesting, interesting model with the idea that mental symptoms in psychiatry are hybrid objects, that they are heterogeneous with many pathways uh, information. But uh, uh, um, unfortunately, uh, 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 Berrios and his colleagues uh, are not able to uh, uh, make clear the causal structure of the symptom and the relation with uh, 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 the uh, disease. The same goes with the network model put forward by uh, Dennis Borboom uh, from the University of Amsterdam, uh, Amsterdam. Sorry, It's a very rich and interesting ID. So Borboom's ID is to use network theory to enrich our understanding of the structure of mental disorders. So the network theory has several advantages. First, it offers an elegant way to deal with what the specialists call uh, the comorbidity problem. So uh, as you see here in this simple diagram, two mental disorders, left and right, uh, can share uh, a number of common uh, symptoms, what you call bridge symptoms, that can be triggered by different factors. So the interesting idea is that there can be symptomatic connection between different disease ident entities. And so there's not just a causal relationship uh, from one to one. And second and above all, uh, symptoms within this model are no longer conceived of as indices. There uh, now, uh, according to uh, uh, Borsboom, there's nothing below the surface of the symptom. Uh, this diagram, uh, uh, by Borsboom is very important to understand the decisive ontological issues at stake. So not the medical model anymore, something like is more uh, 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 a kind, uh, like a psychological model. Because uh, the idea is that uh, the symptom is not produced by uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the central uh, 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 disease. It's just the network and we can modify the equilibrium of the network uh, to relieve the patient of, the, uh, of his uh, symptoms. Uh, and this model also show uh, and also allows us to understand the fine interaction that exists between symptoms like dominoes, symptoms can be more or less strongly connected to each other, depending the disease. They may or may not cause a cascade of other symptoms. This may be the case in depression, in, uh, on, uh, in, in or, or other mental uh, disorders. So 
to conclude, uh, the network model is very interesting model, which can be supported by uh, different uh, studies. But I think it has a very important weakness. And I asked Denis Borboum about that. And I'm not sure that he has uh, yet a very uh, convincing solution. Unlike the Cambridge model, you see that he does not address at all the precise form of what is a mental symptom uh, in his model is in the network model. As you can see, the symptoms are just nodes. A mental symptom is just a bubble. And you can put everything you want in it. Uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, since there's a statistical correlation between them, it, it should be sufficient to, uh, 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 to, to be considered as a mental symptom. So it can be interesting for practical uh, uh, reason, but it can bring many, many conceptual uh, difficulties. So sorry, I, I'm, I was very long. I conclude uh, last slide with a take-home take uh, message. So a medical symptom has not much to do with a linguistic signifier, and the disease is not a text to be deciphered or interpreted. And uh, uh, to... To, to bring light on a current issue, what do the new tools of clinical objectivation like precision psychiatry and the new classificatory approaches like the RDOC change in the conception of the mental symptom? So uh, uh, thank you very much. So uh, uh, as I told you, uh, the, uh, the, the big important issue for me uh, as an historian uh, and a philosopher of psychiatry was to, 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 to put the idea, uh, to, to, to put in light the, the fact that uh, the causal story of a uh, causal relationship between symptom and a mental disorder has always be, been a uh, uh, tremendous issue for uh, uh, classical psychiatrists as uh, for contemporary psychiatrists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. And um, now we, we have a lot of time for, for questions. So, um, if you'd like to ask a question, please uh, write something in the chat so I can um, I can see the order of the uh, people wanting to to ask a question in the chat, um, like your name or I have a question or something. Um, so I see that there is a hand um, because it's the only one I'm going to take it. Uh, Camilo Enrique Sanchez, is, uh, do you? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, professor, thank you very much for the very interesting um, presentation. I would like to ask um, like a two-part question. Um, on the one hand, a, a very broad question, a, what would you think it's the function then of language a, in relation to the psychopathological manifestations, very broad. And another one that it's related and it's kind of more a, a specific that it's the, um, wouldn't you think that this a causal structure approach to the symptoms and to the psychopathological manifestations, don't you think it's just a, another way of the, of the myth? Thank you. Uh, so first question, I have no answer because it's a very important question. And I think uh, 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 that's part of my uh, work today to try to, 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 to think about this issue. Uh, and that's why I had to make this in historical investigation first, because uh, I think many people agree about the importance of language in uh, mental symptomatology, not only to recognize and to identify mental symptoms, but also to, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, to, to shape the, the very nature of the symptom. And for instance, uh, 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 Berrios in the Cambridge model is uh, 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 very uh, interesting in the way he shows the, um, uh, the, the, the very uh, important influence of not only the language, but the culture and many factors in the shaping of the symptom, not as just accessory, but in the very nature of the symptom. And I think uh, he's uh, uh, right about that. And I think it was a very wrong mistake made by the DSM just to try to isolate 
uh, uh, some very uh, uh, general symptoms and uh, 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 from any uh, 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 clinical context. So I think that uh, it, it, uh, the symptomatology has never been uh, uh, some fact that you can isolate uh, from the, the, the context, and it's still a very important issue. Uh, um, I had to, to, to make, uh, again, this work, because as you know, there's ve two very different ways to bring uh, uh, the issue, and it co I come to your second question. Uh, uh, one way is the philosophy of science uh, side, it's uh, kind of my way, okay? So to, to put uh, uh, the um, emphasis on the causal structure of the symptom and the other influent uh, uh, way is the phenomenological uh, uh, approach of, uh, cl of uh, uh, clinical knowledge, okay, phenomenology. Uh, so it has a long story back to uh, Biswanger and Minkowski. Uh, and uh, they uh, put the uh, emphasis on the fact that a symptom has a meaning. And I think that's uh, a very important issue because uh, many, many symptoms as some kind of meaning for, for people. And it's just not uh, 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 another la la layer about the consideration of a symptom. So I think it's still today a, 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 a philosophical uh, a problem. Uh, now uh, uh, to say, uh, uh, according to the myth, my, my, my work uh, until now is not normative, it's just descriptive. I just tried to understand what was in the head of a clinician until the 50s, of, un, until the middle of the 20th century. So I have no idea what they sh should think about the symptom. I just tried to describe what they had in uh, their head. And what I said uh, is just that, okay, there was, this broad general conception as an index okay, for the symptom. And there was two new conceptions. In France, it was the idea of the symptom as a signifier. Uh, so like the diagnosis, like a text to be deciphered, what I, I told today. And uh, at the same time, uh, mostly in the US and in the uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, 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 psychiatry, uh, there was many authors who say, okay, we don't want to consider uh, the, the symptom uh, as uh, 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 an index, just as a fact that can be observed uh, with statistical uh, 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 tools. And it's quite also a very different uh, 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 meaning of uh, uh, the, the, the symptom. It's, it brings exactly the same difficulties that the one uh, we can uh, uh, show with uh, Dennis Borsboom uh, model of the network analysis. Because if we just uh, uh, agree with the definition, any uh, statistical strong correlation with some uh, uh, causal uh, network could be said to be a, 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 a symptom of a pathology. Like, for instance, if uh, I don't know, uh, to have uh, three children uh, uh, is uh, highly uh, correlated with anxiety, it should be uh, considered as a symptom. But no clinician wants to consider this as a, a symptom. Okay, so that's bring very uh, huge conceptual def uh, definition. Also. So I don't know if I, I was clear enough. Uh, and if you're happy with my uh, long, I'm can so I, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Can I have a small uh, follow-up? Yeah, sure, you can. Um, it, for example, wouldn't you, wouldn't, what would you think if instead of looking for the meanings uh, regarding language as a, as, a, as a pathway to psychopathological manifestation, uh, instead of focusing on meaning, wouldn't, what do you think if we focused more on the temporal uh, features of language, some kind of rhythm or syntactic um, aspect of language? But can you elaborate a little bit, a little more? What, what do you think? Uh, do you have yeah. uh, some author in mind? No, 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 not really. It's just like a, um, because because for sure, as you said, a language has been a, a, a very difficult aspect to, to define this relation with the mm -hmm. psychopathological manifestation. Mm -hmm. 
So mm-hmm. uh, I I was thinking uh, due to my to my research uh, that maybe we should not focus so much on the meaning of language, but more on its temporal features, like trying to find some kind of um, patterns in the rhythmic unfolding of patients in her, in their narratives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, that's an interesting issue. Yeah, there's, there's, there are a lot of uh, uh, work about that. I, I would not be able to, to, to say m- 